Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman, and on behalf of Jewish Funders Network, I'm happy to welcome you to today's program, Finger on the Pulse and Eye on the Day After. COVID-19 has commanded the attention of the Jewish community and shifted its priorities. However, the communal issues that were pressing before the pandemic have not gone away. When the immediate crisis recedes, concerns about the growing rift between Israel and diaspora Jewish community will once again come into focus, but with a new angle, with new angles to explore. Philanthropists Charles Brockman and Jeff Solomon have co-founded a new startup, Enter, the Jewish People at Alliance, devoted to ensuring that the Jewish people remain a dynamic, diverse, global community that is united, secure, and inclusive. This program brings together leaders from this initiative to examine some of the complicated issues around peoplehood that will resurface in an altered environment. Our conversation will explore how funders can effectively engage in the field of Israel diaspora affairs through uh, an adaption in the most unusual environment. And now I am happy to introduce Jeff Solomon who will moderate our panel and frame our conversation more today. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks, Tamar, and, and thanks to Tamar and Andres McCoyney and the leadership of the Jewish Funders Network for putting together a series of, of wonderful programs, um, and hopefully this will be one of them. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, I know we have people from the West Coast of the United States to the uh, East Coast of Israel that have joined us, and uh, we're very grateful for your participation. I'm gonna spend um, no more than 90 seconds trying to provide some background on how ENTER began. Um, and then we're gonna jump into a conversation with three remarkable people. Um, Anita Friedman, who, um, who uh, we realized the other day, we know each other for 40 years. And, and uh, you know, I understand that at my age, I don't understand it at Anita's. Um, but Anita has been the um, executive uh, director, CEO of the Jewish Family Service San Francisco, which is one of the leading uh, JFSs in the country um, and uh, serves as the president of the Correct Foundation. She is um, very much involved in, in um, globally in, uh, on the board of APAC um, locally on the Human Rights Commission, um, and it is an extraordinary leader in the, the San Francisco community. And according to uh, the Jewish gossip columns, is uh, one of Kamala Harris's uh, early and best friends. Um, Ambassador Daniel Shapiro is also a friend of 40 years. Um, he would have been uh, 12 or 11 at the time. Um, he uh, served, as most of you know, as President Obama's ambassador to Israel and um, is, um, has since then um, joined the faculty of um, INS, the National, the, Inter the Israel um, National Security um, Institute, and um, is a uh, great friend to all of us. The most important uh, part of his bio is he is the co-chair with Dan Shapiro of the Professional Advisory Committee of ENTER. And finally, um, Alan Friedman, uh, the founding CEO of ENTER, um, comes to us from a, a career um, in um, this field, in, in the relationship between Israelis and the rest of the Jewish world following a bachelor's and master's at Hebrew University um, and a distinguished uh, career in the ID, IDF as, a, as an officer. Um, he, served, uh, he served at Young Judea, um, at Massah, at Wujis, and for the seven years prior to starting with ENTER was the CEO of Hillel's of Israel, where he did an extraordinary job if, for those of you that follow that. Um, how did ENTER start? Um, ENTER started in, in some ways because HUC in 2018 um, asked Charles Bronfman to accept an honorary doctorate. And in um, preparing for that, 
he found himself getting angrier and angrier at the idea of second class Jews and um, was quite outspoken um, about the treatment of non-Orthodox Jews, both in Israel and beyond Israel. And really believes, as do I, that, that we are reaching a tipping point. If the creation of Israel and Zionism is really a project of the Jewish people, then it's incumbent upon um, the Jewish people globally and Israeli Jews to um, work hard at that alliance, at that relationship. And in the past number of years uh, with specific issues, um, this government um, has made it more challenging. Um, in 2017, the abrogation of the um, compromise on the Western Wall, the um, uh, nation state law, continued concerns that, that are disconnecting young Jews to Israel. And, um, and as is our want, we said, okay, what can we do about it? And that's what you're gonna be hearing about from our three speakers. And you know, with that in mind, um, Dan, you and Dan Meridor chair the professional advisory committee and it consists of members with a wealth of experience in many aspects of Jewish life, uh, both locally and globally. From those deliberations um, emerged a strategic approach that um, is aimed at reversing the perceived trends of a rift between the Jews of Israel and those of the rest of the world. What is some of the preliminary thinking that has set that framework? So thank you, Jeff, uh, for the opportunity. It's great to be with you, be with Anita, be with Alone. Thank you to the Jewish Funders Network for hosting us and the opportunity to talk about the progress we have made and are making uh, on ENTER and the exciting uh, chapters, I think, that are uh, very, uh, very much unfolding as we speak. So we identified, or really Charles and you identified, and many of us uh, agreed uh, and built out an understanding of what are some of the sources of the rift, or at least the perception of a growing rift between uh, Israel and especially a younger generation of uh, diaspora Jewry. Uh, the issues of pluralism and the respect for all streams or the treating of equal Jews of all streams, uh, all backgrounds, all religious practices equally and, and treating them equitably by public authorities. As you said, the things that really got to Charles as he was uh, preparing for his HU speech, HUC speech, the issues of Israel's Jewish and, and democratic character, which uh, touch on but are certainly not exclusively about uh, the Palestinian issue, uh, very much about the institutions of democracy in Israeli life, and indeed uh, strengthening uh, concern about the need to strengthen uh, the civil society and, and democratic institutions of Israel in full realization of the Israeli Declaration of Independence. And these, of course, are not new issues. We've had uh, uh, versions of these uh, concerns uh, arise from into the headlines from time to time. I certainly saw my share uh, of them during the years I was ambassador. And in the past, what we've often seen has been the reaction of uh, diaspora uh, Jewry or world Jewry leadership uh, has been uh, an effort to influence uh, these decisions uh, being made in the halls of uh, the Israeli government uh, by flying in uh, a, a delegation of uh, influencers, of leaders, of community activists, uh, to lobby, to express the concerns, to uh, speak about uh, how uh, a particular debate, who is a Jew or conversion or, or, or other, or, or the, uh, the Kotel uh, is being perceived in, their, in these diaspora communities. And then of course, going home. And uh, we've all seen that those uh, efforts have not been nearly as effective as uh, any of us would like them to be. There are some ups and downs and some, some successes and then some backsliding but certainly not a sustainable uh, kind of approach. And so what we all thought as we sat together first with you and, and Charles and uh, then building out this uh, uh, pro pro professional advisory committee and obviously with the input of, of other funders and founders uh, was that there really is a need to instead deepen a mutual aware, a sense of mutual awareness and understanding in Israeli society instill a, a stronger sense of mutual responsibility 
and unity across the Jewish world. And ultimately, by doing so, to build a cohort of Israelis, Israeli citizens, who are knowledgeable about world Jewry, who seek uh, to have their own leaders uh, place the unity with world Jewry and taking the needs and values of those other communities into account uh, as a priority uh, when uh, Israeli institutions and, and, and decision makers are, are reaching decisions. We've done a lot of these kinds of efforts within the uh, diaspora community, certainly in North America, but elsewhere as well. Of course, Birthright is one of the great uh, success stories but other exchange programs, other uh, summer camp, other day schools uh, have done a lot to bring the story of Israel to our uh, diaspora communities. Uh, and there's more work to do on that by, by no stretch of the imagination are we done. But we, we definitely identified the need to do, uh, undertake a kind of similar effort in Israel in a way that really has not been done uh, in a systematic way. I'll leave the details uh, to alone for when he gets a chance to talk about it. But as we drill down to what we felt would make the biggest difference, uh, in the professional advisory committee, we thought, look, this first of all starts with education. It's not a one-off. It's not a, a, a one-day or one-week trip. Uh, there may be elements of that. There may be opportunities to do reverse uh, birthright, reverse tuckleet kind of opportunities. But we really need a, 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 an infrastructure of educational opportunities uh, sponsored by and in partnership with the Israeli relevant Israeli ministries, the Ministry of Education, of course, and the Ministry of Diaspora Affairs. Uh, to create opportunities in informal settings, in direct exchanges between Israelis, young Israelis and young uh, diaspora Jews, uh, in travel, uh, in coursework, in developing new curriculum, in empowering principals and schools and other educators uh, to bring the story of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of peoplehood, of Jewish unity of the, of the Jewish people uh, into the Israeli education system. Uh, and, and to sustain that at every level uh, of the Israeli education system. Uh, secondly, we identified uh, public awareness. This is in a way goes beyond the education system, but to bring uh, into uh, Israeli society you know, through culture, through the media, uh, through, uh, uh, through celebrities, through, through political leaders, uh, a greater public awareness uh, about uh, the issue of Jewish peoplehood, about the uh, needs, the concerns, the values, and the sense of unity with uh, Jews outside of Israel. Uh, and third, uh, to create the tools to be able to measure uh, in-house in our own, uh, with our own expertise, uh, what is happening in uh, these, what are the trends? Uh, we, we've talked about a Jewish peoplehood index, index, which over a period of years, this is clearly going to be a project of years, if not decades, uh, to identify uh, the trends, to better distinguish what's happening in different subgroups of both populations uh, to assess attitudes and behaviors uh, and to really expand our ability to both measure and then intervene in response to what we're seeing in those measurements. So in the last uh, year uh, since the public or yeah, a little less than a year since the public advisory, uh, the professional advisory committee met uh, and identified those priority areas, we've uh, been handing it off to Alon, you'll hear from him shortly, uh, to build uh, the infrastructure, the team, the staffing, the, uh, the tools and the partnerships uh, necessary to carry that out. And uh, I think the impact uh, can be very, very, very uh, profound. I'll stop there because there's a lot more to say, but uh, uh, Anita and Alona also have a lot to add here. Thanks, Dan. And um, let me just remind everybody that on the bottom of your screen is a Q&A function. Um, we will have opportunity for uh, conversation among us and hopefully with you. So please feel free to use the Q&A function at, at any time. Um, we're talking with you as a group of funders and Anita, your leadership of the Correct Foundation has often been about becoming an early adapter, um, whether in Israeli small business development um, or the use of program related investment. What were the factors that led you and your board to become supporters of this initiative? Thank you, Jeff, and it's a pleasure to see all of you. We've worked together for many years, and I know there's many people on the call who are our friends, who are deeply engaged in these issues, who've spent your lives working on these issues, as have all of us. So it's really a pleasure to be together this morning to grapple with this issue and talk a little bit about future directions. I think the fact that the Jewish Funders Network exists and brings together people who are concerned about these issues and are leaders in the community 
from all over the world is a good example of how to stitch our people together uh, going forward. So that's a, a tribute to you and to the vision that, it, that under, under, underlies this whole effort. Uh, so I wanna thank you. And Dan, I thought your explanation was very good and really uh, mirrors what we are thinking on the Correct Foundation on the, on the local level. So I'll just say a, a few words about the Correct Foundation and what our thinking is with regard to our funding, especially with regard to this issue. Uh, the Correct Foundation is one of the largest funders in California, one of the largest in the country that funds, especially uh, in the Jewish community, that concerns itself primarily with issues of uh, Jewish life and Jewish peoplehood. And uh, we have been thinking for a while about uh, how to uh, use our funds, as uh, all of us uh, do all the time when we're thinking about funding. And uh, three main questions emerged for us. One uh, was with regard to uh, the Jewish community locally, because ultimately we have to take a look at the state of affairs with regard to the American Jewish community. And uh, I think we all know that the key question that faces us in the United States uh, in many sectors is why be Jewish? And so we took a look at what can we do to inc increase Jewish identification and involvement of our local community in the San Francisco Bay Area is one of the three or four or four largest American Jewish communities in the country. And it's the second largest Jewish community uh, uh, in the, the state of California with regard to the rest of the United States. So uh, these questions matter. And we decided that uh, one of our roles is gonna be to strengthen the Jewish identity and involvement in the, in the greater Bay Area because uh, when people don't care about being Jewish, then why are they gonna care about Israel? So let's talk about the basis for a lot of this. If, if people don't find meaning in their lives by being Jewish, then why are they gonna to, to grapple with these kinds of uh, issues with regard to the US-Israel relationship? So um, we decided on, uh, on one front to uh, try to become a model Jewish community, to demonstrate what it looks like when you have a, a, a community that is a model authentic Jewish community. Uh, we have mostly reformed Jews in the greater Bay Area, but we have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. And we felt that we wanted to elevate the capacity of our pillar institutions to both take care of people who need help, because that's at the heart of what it means to be Jewish, is to take care of the old and the sick and the children, to make sure that nobody's alone, to be a safety net and make it meaningful to be Jewish. And so we went about doing that and we wanna make sure that everyone who needs help gets it. And we also wanna make sure that anyone who seeks education is able to receive it. So we also are a major funder of educational programs in the Bay Area. So uh, the first question was uh, how to help to answer why be Jewish in a way that's really meaningful for the future of the Jewish people in the United States. And secondly, the question for the American Jewish community was why should I care about Israel? And the question that we saw with regard to our work with Israelis is, why should we care about American Jews? So those were our three basic questions and we're helping just to answer those questions by funding uh, this program, ENTER, but also by funding bridge building. We only give funding and, and we, we fund a major multi, multi-million dollar project. We only fund the relationship at this point. We no longer fund only institutions in Israel alone. We fund the relationship. We fund lots of programs that bring Israelis together with American Jews to strengthen the relationship. Uh, that can be uh, developing key relationships between major institutions, major universities, thought leaders in Israel and the United States, funding, bringing uh, thought leaders, developing thought leaders in Israel to the United States to understand who American Jews are. I think we all know um, when, when I do lectures or se sessions with um, uh, emerging leaders in Israel who are in college and thinking about going into government or NGO work or uh, business, uh, when they come to the United States, I think uh, when I ask them, tell me one word that describes your experience coming to the United States for the first time and being with the Jewish community, they almost always say shocked. Sometimes they say surprised. Usually they say it's just shocking to them. So uh, Dan, what you described of really strengthening uh, the ability of Israelis to answer the question about why should we care about American Jews is at the heart of this whole enterprise. So that's, um, that's, a, that's what we do. That's why those are the decisions we made for how to generate um, uh, support for a stronger US-Israel relationship, 
Uh, we have many projects that are focused on that. We're always looking for new projects to fund, but uh, we hope that this will uh, that this will strengthen the Jewish people both in the United States and in Israel and together for uh, for generations to come. I think we're very hopeful. I'll just end with that for now. We're very hopeful because you know when you take a look at Jewish history, I think the fact that we're always preoccupied with our death is one of the reasons why we've we live to be so strong and thriving and peppy and committed and uh, it's a, it's very exciting. It's, it's an exciting time. So uh, let's talk. Thank you. Thanks, Anita. Um, Elon, you recently celebrated your first anniversary as CEO of Enter. It's been quite the year. Um, you were busy working on operationalizing the vision. Um, the pandemic uh, made it a little bit more of a challenge. Why don't you give us a little bit about both operationalizing the vision and how that has changed as a result? Thank you. I'm adding my thanks, of course, to the organizers and to everybody who, who attended. And I'm happy to be here and happy for the opportunity. I was fortunate, um, Jeff, to be onboarded by, by Enter's founders at the stage where um, planning was still undergoing and the, the vision was still um, rough on the edges, I would say. So the first... Um, Five months, six months of my of my position, the the you know the, the first half of the year where where Corona was still a Mexican beer, um, included much uh, consultation with our funders and our advisory committee members, which was still forming then. Um, many of whom, by the way, as as Anita mentioned, I'm I'm happy to learn that are that are with us here today. So so a special shalom to Enter's uh, partners, wherever you are. Um, so as we were working on, on crystallizing our vision, we came to a couple of, uh, of big picture realizations. One was that in the first couple of years of our operation, we will probably need to focus more on the Israeli side than on the diaspora side of the Jewish world. Simply since there's a, a gap in the level of awareness to um, Israel diaspora relations between those two fields. We need to, to um, elevate the level of awareness and to create even a discourse almost from scratch on the Israeli side, while in the diaspora, though much work is to be done, that discourse already exists. Um, another understanding we reached was that we wish to generate an overarching change through focusing on, on those three main areas that, that Ambassador Shapiro um, mentioned before, which I'll just quickly remind, education was about creating a more um, involved and peoplehood aware next generation. That's the, that's the marathon, if you will. That's the generational change that uh, Charles Bronfman was talking about that we seek in order to, to influence the future. Public awareness is, is number two, and that's disseminating more presence of diaspora jury into the daily lives of Israelis. Here, there are some sprint potentials, the, the, the shorter term goals, influencing the presence. And third was, was measurement, mapping, mapping the field in Israel in trying to produce new and valid data, which will enable all players in the field to, to eliminating uh, uh, duplicative efforts, reducing competition uh, on the same resources, and basically to make a, a whole that is going to be bigger than the sum of its parts. So this is where we were back in, in February of this year, following a, a real physical, physical convening um, of our advisory committee, where people actually traveled and sat for lunch in the same room at UJ Federation offices in New York, if you remember that era. Um, and little did we know um, uh, uh, of what's hiding uh, around the corner. So, so at that time, as we were ready to launch and to switch into operational mode, our challenge was immense, but it was clear. How do we translate a vision that includes no less than a cultural change into action? The starting point we felt then was, was favorable. The Jewish world was paying attention to the rift. Philanthropists, um, and federations were dealing with it. Conferences and conventions highlighted it. Jewish media had it under its spotlight. And here in Israel, even we, the, the, the professionals in the field, we knew that the time is right to start attending to this agenda 
full steam ahead. Then came the pandemic and very quickly travel stopped, conventions went online. Actually, it, it was, I think JFN in, in March was due in March and was one of the first ones to cancel uh, the physical and, and, and switch to online. And almost in a snap, the entire discourse changed. Israel diaspora relations, the rift, peoplehood, why be Jewish, all those high priority issues dropped quite a few rungs down the ladder of importance and were replaced with essential discussions about health, safety, economic crisis, survival. Now, when big organizations like um, JFNA and major federations or national institutions like the Jewish Agency switched immediately into emergency mode, and they had the know-how since they did it before, you know, during wars or during uh, natural disasters. For us at Enter, it was pretty clear that we're not in that position. And we cannot and should not alter our vision or change our mission to answer the immediate crisis needs. So our new challenge now was, in a world that totally changed its order of priorities, how to remain relevant when the level of attention to our vision went down so significantly. And this led us to develop the, the, the concept, which is basically the title of today's webinar, a finger on the pulse and an eye on the day after. It became clear very early on that there's no capacity left and no attention span that could be dedicated to public action in the field of Israel diaspora relations. So the portion of our work that focuses on public awareness, media campaigns, uh, professional gatherings, influencing influencers, etc., will need to be tabled until the day after. But at the same time, our two other pillars, education and measure measurement, should definitely keep evolving. Because not being able to accompany our work with awareness campaigns doesn't mean that we're going to table the entire work. And when you can't work out in the sun, you simply go down to your cave and work on your crafts there. You develop and you improve your products while keeping an eye on the day after so that you'll emerge more impactful once you identify that the day after is approaching. And, and, and I'll add here, bimhera amenu amen, hopefully soon in our days, amen. Now, I want to give the stage back to you, Jeff, and, and if time allows afterwards, and if not, we'll have plenty of other opportunities, we, we can go back to more details about the actual crafts that we've been able to develop during these past few months. And, and as a spoiler, I'll just say that as, as soon as this coming January, hundreds of Jewish high school students, Israelis on one side, Americans and Brits on the other, will be performing one-on-one -on -one encounters as part of the formal English studies curriculum of the Israeli Ministry of Education. And these encounters will entitle the Israelis with significant bonus for their final exam, for their bagrut in conversational English. So academics in the front door and people with ed education in the back, uh, that's the spoiler for now and I, I'll, I'll end here. Thanks, Alon. Um, I've got a couple of conversation starters and, and uh, you know, Americans in general, and specifically American Jewish funders, represent the most generous philanthropists in the world by any measure. I've had a, a hypothesis about it that it uh, suggests that it's a synergistic combination of de Tocqueville's findings in the 1830s, namely that Americans are prepared to volunteer their time and treasure in their desire to make a more perfect union, and Jewish thought that stresses every human being is created in the image of God and therefore has infinite value, and that we have the obligation to help complete the cre act of creation by perfecting the world. Israeli philanthropy, while growing in recent years, is not necessarily viewed in these terms. It, this is a uniquely American philanthropic perspective. How might a philanthropic partnership be developed um, on this subject? We've had uh, the experience, to be more specific, of working with Israeli philanthropists on projects of common concern that bring us together on issues that we feel like we want to make sure happen. Uh, for example, uh, we do a lot of work with Tel Aviv University and Stanford University, 
to bring together thought leaders, you know, key decision makers, influencers to do common research or with the University of California, Berkeley. Um, uh, Tel Aviv University is, does an extraordinary job of developing leaders and we feel like that's a place where we wanna focus in Israel. Uh, we're working on some other projects there too. Shalem College, we've worked a lot with them because they have many students who are really interested in becoming thought leaders and influencers in Israel to bring them to the United States, to exchange relationships. So they understand more the differences and also the shared values. So we look for philanthropic uh, partners who are interested in working together with us on projects. And I think that's one of the best ways to build deeper relationships. Anita, if you're done, I'll add a thought, sure. uh, which is where I've seen, uh, I think, tremendous potential uh, beginning to be tapped, but still with much, much uh, opportunity ahead is in the high tech sector uh, in Israel, where, of course, there's been such success, there continues to be a significant investment and growth uh, and a lot of wealth generated. And uh, what I have found in those uh, communities uh, is especially as people have been successful, they've perhaps uh, uh, exited a first company and they're on their second or their third, uh, they really do want to turn uh, some of the wealth they've generated back toward uh, making a, a profound difference in the society. Um, they focus on things like education in the periphery, on bringing high-tech opportunities to uh, communities like the ultra-Orthodox community and the Arab community that are underrepresented, the Ethiopian community that are underrepresented, um, and uh, many other uh, philanthropic areas, I think. Uh, but this is still sort of a relatively younger, uh, relatively less experienced from a philanthropic uh, standpoint uh, population perhaps relatively less uh, focused on some of the issues that are uh, connected with our effort uh, around Jewish peoplehood. Although, as you talk to them, or at least as I've talked to many people in this, uh, in this uh, sub uh, community uh, within Israel, there is a strong understanding of an identification uh, between Israel uh, and Jewish communities outside of Israel. There is a, a strong belief that that helps strengthen Israel uh, there is a sense of, of values of it, frankly, permeates their, their, their business work as well. They are in uh, the high tech fields, not only because it's a way of earning a very good living, but also because they're bringing products to market that are making the world safer and healthier and more productive. And that sense of, uh, you can call it tikkun olam or you can call it uh, anything else, that sense of needing to contribute to making the world better also permeates their sense of their obligations outside the business world and then their, in their philanthropic duties. I think there are opportunities there, especially for uh, uh, people who are focused on, as we are, uh, the question of Jewish peoplehood to recruit some of these uh, new philanthropists into this field as well. And I think it is consistent with the value set that they are demonstrating in other aspects of their, of their work. Um, we're starting to get some interesting questions uh, from uh, the participants, and let me try to combine a couple of them. Um, one question uh, asks, and I'm combining it with uh, uh, an earlier question of uh, um, Israeli society is not monolithic. To what extent will the initiative work with the religious Zionist sector, the Haredi sector, the Mizrahi sector, and others to address this in a culturally competent way. And I would add to that is this week, the World Zionist Congress is meeting. The um, uh, institutions of um, right-wing orthodoxy have the majority that can radically change the institutions, the formal national institutions of uh, Israel and, um, and certainly not move it toward a more pluralistic bent. Um, what is this gonna do to all of us, not just enter, but those who care deeply um, about uh, working on the, these issues? I think it's obvious that, that the, the echo chamber is always the most cozy and, and friendly place to be. Um, but you don't, you don't create a change from there. 
and what we've seen, and I've and I've seen uh, I've seen the other um, question that David was asking as well. What we've seen in the past two years is is a is a development of a, of a coalition of organizations. It was in, initiated by the Reut Institute, and it and it keeps kicking. It keeps conversing, and 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 serves today as a as a great support group of of probably about 150 organizations in Israel um, who are dealing with Israel diaspora relations. And it's true, the, the, the core, the first garin, if you will, started with the usual suspects. Um, but it grew in the, past, in the past couple of years to over 150 organizations. And today we have people who are voicing their perspectives and their hashkafat olam in these forums in manners that the usual suspect or the small echo chamber who we always used to converse about those issues never heard before. And there's nothing more eye-opening and inspiring and you know, all of us being Israelis and also makes you furious when you when you hear those things and you hear different perspectives. The, the answer is definitely yes. There's no doubt that um, uh, other channels of the Israeli uh, um, society will be joining into this conversation. And there's a lot of interest. There's a lot of interest we, we, we see today. We, you, you can never take... Um, um, uh, um, I'm missing a word here, uh, a mainstream person and send him all the way out to speak with the most extreme Haredi or with the most extreme post-Zionist on the other hand. You always have to move, you know, one one brick at the time until you reach the edge of the of the of the fence. And this is exactly what we're doing. Every person brings the immediate margins around them, and then those margins bring those margins around them, and always it keeps on elaborating and growing. And we do believe that once there is a tension span again for speaking about this inter-peoplehood issues and in, inside family issues, um, the circles will grow and there will be a much, uh, a much better uh, uh, and more comprehensive language that will go across the board. We have no doubt. And do any of you have predictions of what's gonna happen this week at the World Zionist Congress? I don't think it's gonna go very well, is what I think. I think that, uh, we don't gonna give up on any sector. This is, we should be thinking about this, that this is gonna be an issue that every single Jewish organization, every single one should be grappling with. Whether they're a, a, a service organization or an educational institution or a day school or a funders network, everybody needs to be thinking about uh, what are we gonna to do to uh, strengthen the involvement of Jews in being Jewish and build a relationship with Israel. And it'll take different forms for different groups, but it has to be on the agenda for the, the decades. It's good. This will go on for decades because uh, we are moving in different directions and we are different peoples who have different experiences, different priorities, different values, but we also do have uh, uh, a sense that our individual fate is linked to our collective fate and we need to work on that. I think that uh, there, there's plenty of work to do without trying to bring the Haredim into this conversation right now. Maybe we will at some point. I mean, they actually have, I mean, I come from that community, so I know that there's actually a lot of relationship between the diaspora in the Haredi community and in Israel, but they have their own issues. Uh, but um, yeah, I don't think that that's gonna be our priority right now. I think we, alone, I think that we need to be thinking about, do they teach even the whole idea of peoplehood any place in Israel? Like do the universities, is there a, a, is there a discussion about this? Is it teach in the schools? Yeah, there, well, yeah, the, there are, you know, the, 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 the absurd is that um, units have been written and there is a new profession, relatively new profession that's called Tarbut Yehudit Israelit, um, but it's very low priority. Teachers and principals will not adopt it. This is why, and again, I'm going back to what, to where we're trying to, to intervene and changing through public, ed public education and, and, and formal education. If you take the subject of English, which is gonna get all the, the, the attention, everybody wants their kids to know better English. Everybody wants conversational English to be thriving in Israel because everybody knows that if you can't speak English, you have a great glass ceiling above your head. If you take the subject of English with all the resources that it has, and you insert peoplehood through the back door through that subject with one-on-one -on -one encounters, talking about everything that young people like to talk about and bringing the messages through the back door, this is where you're gonna create an impact. If you try knocking the door and say, hey, Jewish identity is important, we're all one family, there's a rift, 
it's been tried by the ministries, by all organizations we know. It's been tried. We need to attack it from different angles. Yeah. Well, I think American Jews have other issues with Israel. Um, I don't know, necessarily think that the, if we solve issues about the wall or other things that it's going to go away, because I think it's deeper. Um, why connect to Israel? But uh, you don't, I don't think in Israel there are even teachers who really un, can teach about Jewish peoplehood. I don't know. Is there any university here? Uh, he, they're in Israel that te- that has a, a, a serious program of uh, uh, on Jewish peoplehood. Well, there is actually uh, uh, it's it's a good it's a good opportunity to mention the Ruderman Foundation, who came up with a master's uh, program in Haifa University that deals with um, um, American Jewry and, and involves all those uh, all those topics. But Anita, that's exactly what brings me to the to the and, and I remember the the three questions that you started with. I remember you asking me those questions back in the times of. Uh, of the of the search committee, um, and we didn't answer them in the last uh, nine months. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, so exactly. You're, you're talking about the, the Jewish community locally, and you're talking about if people don't care about uh, being Jewish in America, why would they care about Israel? And the added question to that is, if if, if people in Israel don't care about being Jewish, then even if you know, th- then wh- where, where does the conversation even start? Because you need Israelis to first of all understand that there is a Jewish identity that is not just their Israeliness. Because if we if we fix all the problems of diaspora Jewry and all those Jews understand how important Israel is to their identity and how Judaism cannot exist without Israel, and they come talking to those Israeli Jews and all they get is a uh, what's that about? Then then we, we only went halfway. And this is why I said at Enter, we realized pretty early on that we're gonna have to elevate the level of awareness here in Israel so that we can even create a conversation before we go into encounters with plane tickets, before we go into encounters without plane tickets through Zoom meetings, we need to find the Israelis in their own, you know, safe haven and talk to them about the importance of the Jewish family within themselves without threatening them with encounters. The fact that there is a Jewish state and only half of the family lives here at home. There's another half of the family who doesn't live at home and you should be aware of it because it's your family. And I think it's fair to say that by working with the government uh, ministries, uh, particularly the education ministry, which obviously oversees both the uh, Mamlakhti schools, but also the Mamlakhti Dati schools, the national, uh, where the national religious population is most likely to be found, including in uh, communities that are maybe more, we'd call the Masorti or the Mizrahi, uh, background, they are uh, maybe of a different uh, kind of cultural uh, uh, background. Uh, there is an enormous opportunity to expose a rather broad spectrum of Israeli society, uh, both more secular and more religious, uh, from different streams uh, to this uh, concept of peoplehood and to a curriculum of peoplehood and to these opportunities for engagement. And I actually think that can penetrate more quickly than we think, at least into that, that area of the spectrum. The Haredi community is probably a harder nut to crack and harder to uh, get to work with those uh, educational institutions to uh, to uh, accept and and take on that responsibility of of teaching a peoplehood curriculum as well. Although, as Anita says, uh, it doesn't start from zero. There are connections outside of Israel, perhaps largely within other Haredi communities. Uh, but we know from our own involvement uh, with those communities in, in the United States uh, that it doesn't need to be a, a zero sum, that you, 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 there, are, it, there is a way of building that bridge as well. But I, I acknowledge that is a, a somewhat longer term uh, aspect of this, of this undertaking. Um, so let, let me ask an unfair question, but it's, just, you know, today, so much of what we do is about November 3rd. Um, in, in an analysis of the rift, uh, two issues consistently emerge as critical. The, the official Rabbanut and its lack of acceptance of, um, of rabbis um, that are um, not uh, uh, same-minded and certainly the lack of acceptance of the other movements, the other streams, and the North American desire for a just solution to the Palestinian conflict. Um, here, everybody, including funders, are focused on November 3rd. Do any of you believe that the outcome of the election might impact either of those two factors? Uh, I'm obviously pretty focused on November 3rd. <laughs> I don't want to uh, pretend otherwise uh, and uh, don't want to make this a, a political discussion, but uh, just to try to think of the scenarios. 
you know, when I was serving as ambassador during the Obama administration, there was no uh, real defined American Jewish, uh, rather a, a U.S. government policy on issues of pluralism uh, in Israel. There was reporting on those issues in the uh, International Religious Freedom Report and the Human Rights Report. These are regular reports the State Department does about every country. So we had officers at the embassy who followed those issues. We knew certainly what was going on. Uh, but I was never asked by the State Department to intervene in any way in, let's say, the Kotel discussions, which were under uh, way for about three years during, during that period. Um, I did take the opportunity, though, at some point, almost on a freelance basis, uh, to say to some of my uh, counterparts in the Israeli government, various ministers, for example, that uh, while I didn't have a position on the outcome of those negotiations, it was my observation that a stronger relationship uh, in which these types of tensions were resolved uh, to mutual satisfaction uh, between Israel and the American Jewish community would ultimately be good for the bilateral relationship between Israel uh, and the United States as well. I was very pleased, of course, when the Kotel uh, agreement was announced. It was a product of some very complicated and, and difficult negotiations, but it seemed to be win-win. Then very uh, saddened to see uh, when, uh, when the Israeli government backed away from it. Um, but that advice about uh, the benefits to the bilateral relationship, uh, not just between uh, the two countries during the term of any one administration, but over uh, a period of years and, and even decades and generations, um, I don't know for sure if that would be shared uh, by uh, the current administration if it is indeed returned. Uh, the way it has chosen to interact, the communities it has chosen to focus on, both in the United States and the Jewish community and, uh, and in Israel, uh, may suggest a different, a different approach, uh, including a different approach that uh, 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 touches on those questions of pluralism or whether or not uh, they are even seen as, as, as priority issues. On the Palestinian issue, there's no question uh, there are two potentially very different pathways here. Uh, everybody, nearly everybody, uh, and I certainly am, count myself among them, uh, welcomes the normalization agreements between Israel and the United Arab Emirates, Israel and Bahrain, and uh, very much hopes to see that momentum continued uh, with other countries as well. And I hope that would be true regardless of the outcome uh, of our election. Um, but there's one pathway that says uh, that's the uh, that's the direction of the, of the Middle East, and you, uh, to the to the extent where the Palestinian issue is essentially rendered irrelevant uh, and doesn't require any uh, further work or just sort of waiting until Palestinians accept whatever uh, is available to them. And the Palestinians have all kinds of responsibility that uh, for for the stalemate that has uh, that has uh, befallen uh, both Israel and the Palestinians uh, in the last few years. Uh, but the other pathway would say, why not use the momentum that is generated or the, the new platform of these relations, normalized relations between Israel and Arab states as a, as a way to generate new momentum on uh, both, the, on, on both the, the normalization track and the Israeli-Palestinian track and try to steer back onto a pathway, again, in which both sides have significant responsibilities that will keep a two-state solution alive and viable and, and achievable. And uh, since I think you identified it early on, and this isn't the main focus of Enter's work by any means, uh, that issue uh, still is one of the points of, of, uh, of, of contention and, and of a sense of, uh, of, of, of rift, perhaps, uh, between uh, Israel and, and diaspora Jews, certainly North American Jews. Uh, there's a lot at stake in the sense of whether, which pathway uh, the next administration chooses to, uh, to approach that question. I'll just add something too, because I think uh, I agree, Dan. I think those are very insightful comments, uh, obviously based on your experience. But I will say that uh, your question, Jeff, is really important because uh, in, in the, the context in which American Jews are living really shapes their views about Israel to, to a large degree. And uh, you know, I work a lot, I, as you mentioned, I worked a lot with Senator Harris. Uh, I took her to Israel twice. Uh, the idea of building relationships between others, not in the Jewish community and Israel, is really critical. You know, a lot of work, we do a lot of work with the African American community, with the Latino community, with the California state legislature, with Congress to, to change the conversation and to create a very positive feeling 
about that Israel is more than the conflict. That's really critical. And the current environment has been quite difficult because of the partisanship, uh, the backlash against the current administration, the United States, and their close association with Israel has really colored uh, many people's views uh, about Israel in the Jewish community as well. Uh, if we do have a more bipartisan approach and can stay with a more bipartisan approach, I think that that will bode well towards the Jewish community's relationship uh, between the American Jews and, and Israel. Uh, right now it's become quite partisan because everything in the United States right now is, uh, is extremely partisan and uh, very difficult to, follow, to find common ground. Although, um, there still remains bipartisanship and common ground on the, is, on the issue of Israel. This, the, the peace agreement with Bahrain and with the UAE, the resolution in Congress right now uh, is uh, one of the only places where I have seen uh, extraordinary bipartisan enthusiasm for that agreement. And there will be a resolution, I think, that will be coming out that will be very impressive, both from the House and from the Senate. So there is hope that we can still find common ground, but it's, it's, it's like pulling a train uphill right now. Thank you both. Very, very insightful. Elon um, uh, Amnon Rodan, uh, a good friend of ours who uh, um, is a longtime supporter of Reut, um, asks uh, a question, and you mentioned the Reut coalition a moment ago, um, which is, he, he points out how fractured the field is. And um, existing organizations are not necessarily uh, there to handle this topic. Um, in joining a crowding, crowded field, um, how can the topic be consolidated so that the field is less fraction, fractured and there's a more unified voice? I think I, I, I've seen Amnon's question and thank you, Amnon, and it's, it's great that you're here. Um, I think that our, our, our third pillar of measurement, as weird as it may sound, exactly wishes to attend to this issue. Because today, when we look at the field in Israel of the organizations who are working on it, when, and again, whether it's the national institutions and the big agencies or the, the, the small uh, um, um, foundations or Israeli offices of uh, diaspora organizations, every organization wakes up every morning with a feeling that they are single-handedly saving the world that um, the entire responsibility lies on their shoulders, that everything that the others do um, is either competing for their same resources or duplicating their efforts. And I think what this field lacks in Israel, and again, it's a young field. I mean, we're attending to it in, I think, in a, in a, in a pretty good uh, uh, phase, stage in time. Um, what, what this field needs in Israel is a, is a language that will be valid by research that will create some sort of an index that will show us what is right and what works and what doesn't work. Maybe categorize this huge factory of organizations and be able to define together with the field. Nobody's, got, no, nobody's trying to you know, come from, a, from, from, from the top and, and try to disseminate things or shove things down uh, uh, organizations' throats, if you will. But to take this, this, uh, uh, this field and work together to create some sort of an index that will enable us to see who's expert in what whose resources are most suitable to deal with which challenges. And if we're able to do that, and it starts with mapping, which has never been done before, and we are in the first strides of doing it. And after mapping, categorizing, and after categorizing, figuring out together, what is it that should be uh, uh, prioritized? And who should do what, as opposed to everybody doing everything? And, and uh, I think that... Uh, um, you will see pretty soon that uh, um, that this language will start being a little bit more clear, and the coalition of organizations again that was uh, uh, established by by Reut, with a lot of support from from the Rodan family, um, is definitely the best basis for this discussion. And my personal view is that this coalition, the, the good, the one good place where this coalition of Israeli organizations of people who should stay is the Reut Institute. I think this is the right place to keep on cultivating. Um, this coalition, and we're looking forward to, to, to starting working with these organizations and, 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 and come to start solving those problems. You know, I think it's very good um, to, for us, to, for you to try to tidy us up a little bit, and organize us, but I, I, I think that it's actually not a bad thing that every organization leader wakes up and thinks about 
how they're responsible for m moving the entire world in a better direction. I, I don't. I think it's not a bad thing for so many different people to be involved. And competition is is not a bad thing too. It's made our country great. But I think if we can find issues of common concern to build co strategic alliances around, I, I think uh, that will be a good thing. And I think people will want to be a part of that. I agree. And, and I think that leaders of organizations but should, should always define to themselves what are the things that they shouldn't be attending to in addition to what they should be focusing on. Um, and I think maybe a little bit of that is lacking currently in the Israeli field of, of people of organizations. So one last question. We have a couple of minutes left and, and Abby Dabba Stern um, asks a simple but very complex question. Um, how is peoplehood in Israel different than pluralism? Beyond awareness of Jews around the world, isn't the aim to help is Israel becoming more accepting of different kinds of Jews? I, I would very much like to, to, to address this very quickly um, because it's a side note to, to what you presented before, Jeff. And I think, I think what's happening now is that we're, we got too, too accustomed. It's too comfortable for us to, to chant that the two issues that differentiate Israeli and, and diaspora Jews are the Palestinian topic and the religious pluralism. And we always count these two in one breath and, 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 you know, and it's there, it's on the table. I, I would like to run a quick experiment and say, let's assume that tomorrow, all of a sudden, we have solved the Palestinian issue, two-state solution, or if you will, Palestinians are vanishing into a, a place that is amazingly uh, uh, serving to them, whatever solution you may think of. But let's say there's no issue of the Palestinian, uh, uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict anymore. We, the Jews, are still going to be left with a painful, bleeding wound of the only Jewish state in the world does not accept different kind of Jews. On the other hand, if we solve that issue and the Jewish state starts accepting and relating differently to different kinds of Judaism and understanding how Judaism evolved outside of a Jewish state throughout the years, I believe that then we will also find a mutual understanding and mutual language to deal about our discrepancies with regards to the Palestinian issue. So what I'm basically trying to say and what came out as a little complex uh, statement is that it's not two equally uh, uh, burning issues. The internal family conflict of the Jewish state and religious pluralism is I think more burning and more bleeding and more potential for, for a growing rift than the, the Palestinian issue. And to Abby's question, hi Abby, I think this is exactly what we're supposed to, to try and achieve, becoming more accepting of different kinds of Jews. And if not the Jewish state will be that accepting entity, how can we expect others to do? I want to thank all three of you. Um, you've been amazing, uh, concise. We really got to, to a, a lot of work. And before saying goodbye, turn it back to Tamar. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Jeff and Anita and Alon and Dan for your time. And for, more importantly, for the work that you're doing every day um, to help our more global Jewish community and in this issue of Jewish peoplehood. So thank you for your partnership in, in this webinar and beyond. And thank you to all the participants um, for joining. If you have any questions about this program or others, you can reach out to me and I can help you get in touch with the presenters so you can learn more about this exciting initiative and the work that they're doing. Thank you everybody and stay well and have a good day.